do join me in inviting two very inspiring Nobel laureates. These great women have really done so much in the face of a whole lot of obstacles. Join me in inviting Shireen and Marid. خاطره زنانی را که به مخالفت با جنگی برخواستند که مردان شروع کرده بودند. I am here to respect and commemorate the memories of women who came uh, to uh, demonstrate against a war that men had started. تا زمانی که جنگ تجارت پرسودی است کشدار مردم بیگناه ادامه خواهد داشت هر زمان به بهانه ای until the day that war is a profitable business the killing of the civilians and innocent people will continue regardless of the excuse گاه به بهانه امنیت ملی زمانی به خاطر خاک و گاه دیگر به خاطر خدا و اعتقادات مذهبی sometimes on the excuse of the land sometimes on the excuse of another excuses and sometimes on the excuse of religion چنان که ما اکنون شاه در خاورمیانه شاهد کشدار مردم بیگناه و غیر نظامی هستیم و به عنوان یک مسلمان متاسفم که از نام اسلام سوء استفاده می شود We can see at the present time in the Middle East that uh, innocent people are being killed in wars. And I'm, as a Muslim, very sorry to see that Islam has been used as the excuse. Kispati az mushkilat khabar miyane nashi az yek guruhi be naam Daesh ast ke baraye mubarize ba an aetilafi از چهل کشور به سرکردگی آمریکا درست شده که هر روز هم مواضع اونها رو بمباران می‌کنند. A group named ISIS has created many problems in the Middle East today and a coalition of 40 countries under the leadership of America has been formed to bomb them every day. باید توجه داشت که داعش فقط یک گروه تروریستی نیست. بلکه یک ایدولوژی نادرست و ایدولوژی رو با بم نمیشه از بین برد. We have to remember that ISIS is not simply a terrorist group. It's an ideology and an ideology cannot be fought with bombs. این ایدولوژی غلط فقط با اشاعه تفکر درست و تفسیر درست از مذهب امکان پذیره. This wrong ideology can only be fought with a correct interpretation of religion. اگر بر سر طالبان به جای بمب کتاب ریخته بودید و اگر به جای حمله نظامی به افغانستان به نام و به یاد 4000 نفری که در فاجعه 11 سپتامبر کشته شده بود چهار هزار مدرسه در افغانستان ساخته شده بود اکنون مشاهده وضعیت بهتری بودیم had books been thrown at people at the Taliban instead of bombs and had schools been built in Afghanistan for uh, 4,000 schools could have been built in memory of the 4,000 people who died on 9-11 At this time, we wouldn't have had ISIS.
و فراموش نکنید که ریشه داعش هم از طالبان بنابراین تجربه شکست خورده رو دو مرتبه تکرار نکنید Let's not forget that the roots of the ISIS rest in the Taliban. So let's not repeat the experience that was a loss. وقت من بسیار کمه و من به عنوان پیشنهاد مشخصم به سازمان ملل متحد این است. I only have a, a very short time to speak, so I have a specific suggestion for the United Nations. با تصویب کنوانسیونی دولت‌ها رو تشویق کنید که حداقل ده درصد از بودجه نظامی خودشون رو کاهش بدن و اون رو صرف آموزش و بهداشت مردم کنن. I demand that the United Nations through a convention encourage all countries to reduce their military budgets by 10% and use it for the education and welfare of the people. Vaz Omrika va keshwar hai qarbi khahesh mi konam be jay bomb sar mardom kitab berezid. Mi binid ke dunya ye behtari khahim dash. And I want to ask the United States and the Western world to throw books at people. You will see that we will have a better world in the future. Dr. Hami Javasi, Hami Javasi, let's go. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. <laughs> it's such a joy to have the wonderful opportunity to be here with you for the next few days. What a delight to be able to meet each other and to greet each other. Thank you. <laughs> I would like to offer my sincere congratulations to Wilf on this through 100th birthday. Isn't that absolutely wonderful? <laughs> and when we started in Northern Ireland, um, mostly women, but also with men, they say very clearly, no to all violence. We have got to stop killing each other here. We reject the use of the bomb and the bullet and all the techniques of violence. We can, through peace, through dialogue, solve our problems. And we took that message out to many countries. And I'm very, very happy to say, I remember going to Sydney when Stella Cornelius from Wilf and the Women of Wilf organized my uh, program there. And in other places I traveled to, it was to Wilf members who hosted me who took care of me and who assured me, don't be afraid, you've got the right message. So I remember them and their kindness and their compassion and their gentleness and above all their encouragement and their affirmation that I was okay <laughs> and, <laughs> and I could do it uh, because I, I was a young woman and I was afraid and I didn't really know what to say or what to do. I thought everyone else had the answers and I shouldn't be in this position until I had my degrees and knew what to say. <laughs> and we've all been there, but they helped me and I'm very grateful to all those women and men who've done that. You know, a hundred years ago here in this very place, um, Wealth members came together, women from all over the world, and their message was so relevant, and it's so important today that that message be spelt out. And I have great admiration from, for Bertha von Suttner. You! <laughs> and Bertha was a friend of Alfred Nobel, 
And she was the woman who encouraged Alfred Nobel to leave his Nobel money for making peace. And you know, she very clearly had the message back then, which we need today. Yeah, and the Nobel will, a Nobel, if you read it, she said, lay down your arms. She also said in that that what was needed to make peace, because it's a process, what was make, made, needed to make peace were uh, abolish armies, abolish militarism. They weren't for tinkering with it, making it more humane, teaching it to be better. They said very clearly a hundred years ago, abolish militarism and war, because it's not the answer. They also said fraternity amongst the nations. How much today we need fraternity amongst the nations? It was a big word, fraternity, but really means being friends. We don't need another Cold War. We don't need to demonize another country. We don't need to demonize and dehumanize other political leaders who, no matter what we think of their policies, have been chosen by their people. We have no right to, to demonize and dehumanize other people and then take them out. Can you imagine how far we have sunk in our sense of ethics, morality, our values of respect for life and each other when we can sit down and plan how to take out another human being? who gave us the right to take out another human being because we don't agree with their policies. The Nobel Charter, Article 13, says we have a right to our life and, our not, and not to be killed and a responsibility not to kill each other. That's a very clear statement. So what we need to, I think, if we make this leap into a new consciousness, we need to uphold human dignity, human rights, international law. So the message that they were saying 100 years ago, end militarism and war, build our global politic and our local politic on international law and human rights. Today in America, let them remember their history, because it was Eleanor Roosevelt, that great American woman, who helped write the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. They have it all there. They have their constitution. America could help lead the world in peacemaking, not in war. We've had our day of war. So if we want to really change our world, and it's changing anyway, <laughs> it's changing anyway, but if we want to really change our world, we must challenge our governments to have the highest standards of international rights and uh, laws to be built on the absolute dignity of every man, woman, and child in our world today. Because we are precious and they are precious. Women have a huge task ahead of them because women are great peacemakers. They birth life and they must be the ones who stand up for every life and say, it's our child too. You can transfer the world. And I, I'm very hopeful. We're in a new consciousness. And that consciousness is bringing us into an evolution of being the human family, taking care of each other, and holding our world together in love and compassion. It's a wonderful journey. Thank you for being on it. Thank you, thank you. 
Are you all ready to become part of this great women's power to stop war movement? Yeah. I can't hear you. Are you ready? Madeline, can you hear them? Are you ready to become part of this great change? Yeah. Whoa, How thank you? you. I am honored to invite a visionary leader, an inspiring teacher, a great woman of our time. She has revived this movement with this great revolution within wealth. She is our own very Secretary General, Madeline Rees. Well done. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for being here, for being part of our movement. Today, there are over 80 countries represented in this room. You have come from war zones and areas where there is conflict, even if it is not declared. So to the human rights defenders and the activists in this room, we are honored by your presence and we salute you. To those who are still and are forever fighting to make sure that we retain our rights to our sexuality, to our reproductive rights, we are grateful that you are here with us today and we thank you for your work on the behalf of all of us. And for the men in the room, we're delighted you're here to engage in ending patriarchy and bring an end to conflict. I always wonder if Jane Addams was here, if Letta Jacobs were here now, would they be pleased with what we have achieved? And just looking in one direction, what have we achieved? Reference has already been made to the fact that we have a United Nations, we have a system, we have a charter of the United Nations, we have the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and human rights treaties and conventions and mechanisms for implementation. We've had four world conferences on women, we have the Women, Peace and Security Agenda. We have world courts to adjudicate all of the above. And so we should be pleased, right? But it's not working. It's not working. We have worked so hard, done so much, achieved so much. And yet still, we have not been able to bring the peace that we have been demanding. And there are reasons for this. Our founding mothers said that if they privatized the arms industry, we would let free market capitalism into matters of security, and they were right. Security arrangements based on militarization will never work. Last year alone, $1.776 trillion was spent on arms. I have no many idea how many noughts that is, but it's far too many. That's 480 times the UN budget, it's so 480 years of the UN budget, 6,500 years of UN women's budget, and much more importantly, would have delivered the Millennium Development Goals several times over. We would have eradicated poverty, we would have had universal education, we would have access to clean water and healthcare, and we would have stopped the degradation of our planet with just one year's money that was spent on arms. And whilst we're busily spending money on arms, the economic system is failing us. There is a concentration of resources and power in the hands of the few. 1% own 48% of the world's wealth at the moment. Next year, it's likely to be 52%. And it will accelerate and accelerate and accelerate until there is no longer such thing as democracy because your countries will be owned by those people who have that wealth. And they will need the military to protect them and they will continue to degrade our planet and stop the degradation of the environment in order to keep that wealth for themselves. So we need to act. How are we going to do that? The one thing we have learned is that a multilateral system is needed. That we have found from our founding mothers. We know we need to talk. But how do we do that when our system is failing us, when it has let us down so dramatically over this last 100 years? 
Right now, when there is conflict, the default position is military intervention. And women from those countries in conflict right now know exactly the cost and the consequence of that intervention. Right now, we have subordinated international law and human rights to the interests of those powers that do not bring peace. We have to reclaim it. So Wilf has always done the difficult things, asked the difficult questions. Last week at our Congress, we adopted a manifesto which is fit for purpose for the next 100 years, only we hope we aren't going to have to work for 100 years to bring peace. We have to be smarter than that. We have a manifesto, and then we did this. We thought, what a great idea to bring people together, to reorganize and galvanize ourselves into action for peace. So what we did was we decided on a conference that would address in three parts those issues that we really need to be focusing on to make this change. Part one is in our plenary, which deals with root causes. And we're going to explore in that the political economy from a gender perspective. And I'm not going to tell you the secrets of all of that, because the plenary will do that for me. But essentially, we're going to look at power structures and how power structures influence how we, as men and women, fit into that world, how we negotiate power, who has it, who doesn't have it, from the family to employment and onwards. And then what happens with that power in a patriarchal system? How does that lead to violence? And we'll hear from people who have experienced that violence individually and in countries where the consequences of that are so dramatic. And we'll hear about justice and what that would look like. And then from there, we will shift seamlessly to looking at masculinities and militarism and armed conflicts. So we need to look, how do you get from being a soldier, or being an ordinary boy, to being a soldier? How are women being forced into that role now? How are we going to control this incredible arms race, this incredible arms production? How are we going to actually deal with the continuing and ever escalating threat of nuclear war? And because the human species being genius of reinvention, how are we going to deal with the technology which is now developing technical abilities to kill without people being involved, killer robots? And in our third session, we want to fix it. We want to hear from women who have been part of the system and not part of the system, who have negotiated peace outside and inside. What do you do? How do you make it work? How do you participate? How do you make your values, your absolute emphasis on human rights and peace, part of those peace agreements and make them sustainable and effective. We'll hear the difficulties of participation, we'll hear the problems of engaging, and we will find solutions as to how we actually negotiate those processes and those systems. When we've done that, at the same time as we're doing that, the flesh of our conference is you. In all the breakout sessions, we'll be exploring in detail all the elements that need to feed into those plenaries. So by the time we have finished on Wednesday, in our closing, we'll be able to bring all the richness of your thinking, of your ideas, of your strategies, into a closing which we hope will be the driving force for the future. This is not a conference where we're going to make demands of the United Nations. It's not a conference where we're going to bring demands of your nation states. So you can, if you want. It's a conference with a slight difference, because what we want to do is we want to look to ourselves. <laughs> we have achieved so much, as I said before. We have that multilateral system. We have that normative framework. We have it all, but it's not working. So having built it, we now need to see how we make it work, and we make it work from working on the outside in. It sounds huge. Within this room, there are 900 people. Listening around the world, there will be thousands, possibly hundreds of thousands of people will listen to our messaging. Each one of us has a role to play. Sitting from here, looking at the world, listening to the news, it's terrifying. And it's big. It's huge. You will feel daunted by the very fact of its existence and think, you know, what can I do? As I often do, I think I'm off to watch meerkats or I'm going to adopt another puppy because it's easier. 
It's a good thing to do as well. Don't let that stop you. <laughs> but at the same time, it's easier to not pay attention and get on with our lives and be distracted from the necessity of the things we have to address. We are addressing patriarchy, capitalism, militarization, the degradation of our environment, and there is nothing more pressing in our lives today than those things. So what we're going to demand, ask of you, is that each one of us, individually, we have teachers, social workers, scientists, educators, academics, you name it, lawyers, plenty of lawyers in the room, um, that we band together, each in our own way. We can't do it all. Not everybody can do everything, it's impossible. But we can all do something. And if we all do something, and we're paying attention to what the others are doing, then we have a movement. Never forget that there are more of us wanting an end to warfare and permanent peace than there are of those who want it to continue. So in our closing, you will come with your brilliant solutions of what you're going to do. And we will put them all together. And we will then start moving towards a new movement for change. And we'll ask you not just to put them out here now, but in a year's time to revisit it at other conferences in other places. And we'll see how far we can push this movement for change. So just in closing, there's a lot of work to do. We have three days to start off with, so be brilliant. Think outside the box, work together, work with each other, and at the end, we'll bring it together. As my daughter said, she's eight years old, and she said this after the, the killings in France, but it applies just about everywhere. They didn't have to kill each other, mommy. They just had to talk, that's all. And that is what we want to make sure happens. This morning, we start our work. We start a new movement, and it starts today with all of us in this room. Just do it. Thank you, Madeline, for that very inspiring and motivating keynote address. From one very amazing leader to another great leader, one of the fearless, the most bravest leaders of our time. She is a passionate, powerful woman leader who, in the face of great danger and great change, stood up and looked power in the face. Please do permit me and join me in welcoming a real mobilizer from my own continent, Africa, Lema Bowie. Thank you, Joy. Woo! <coughs> Jody does the whistle thing. And I think 100 years ago, one continent was absent, and that was Africa. Today, we are here. <laughs> Thank you. Happy birthday, Wilf. 100 years of causing trouble in a good way. I'm happy to be here. It's always a refreshing time to be in the presence of activists and sisters and feminists and whatever else you call yourself. <laughs> I'm also happy to see some men who are brave enough to step into this space <laughs> and feel how it, and, and just experience how it feels to be intimidated when your, your, your gender is the minority. We want to say welcome to everyone, and I'm saying welcome to the Africans in the room because this is great that we are here. I'm 
I'm grateful to God for the opportunity, and I'm going to say thank you to Madly, her team, and to the entire WILF team for honoring me and the Nobel Women's Initiative, asking us to be here and just being a part of this. I also like to recognize my Nobel sisters and really just say we miss the presence of Tawaku and Rogaberto because of different reasons. Whew, this is a big one. <laughs> we, the international women assemble here, protest against the madness and horrors of war, involving as it does a reckless sacrifice of human life and a destruction so much that humanity has labored to build. The International Congress of Women opposes the assumption that women can be protected under conditions of modern warfare. It protests vehemently against the odious wrongs of which women are the victims in times of war, and especially against the violation of women which attends all war. We express sympathy to the sufferings of whatever their nationality, those who fight for their countries, or those laboring under the burdens of war. Unquote. These words were the sentiments expressed a hundred years ago by the women at The Hague as they did their resolution, adopted it at the end of their Congress. One would think, hearing those words, that this conference had ended and we were reading our resolution. Our world today is belabored with similar, even worse situations. Whilst activism has increased and the political dynamics of, has somewhat shifted, militarism, the war economies has increased, making peace seem elusive. It is refreshing, however, to see that women are more defiant in their pursuit of global peace and social justice. Today, even after some of the worst atrocities with the aim of silencing women, we are refusing to shut up. Rather, we're using our pain and experiences as the fuel to begin our journey of the quest for peace. We come with all of our emotional, psychological, and physical burdens on this journey on the quest for peace. 100 years ago, the women, like today, were all committed to a single cause, peace. Women from warring nations came with an understanding that they could not separate their sense of patriotism from their personal welfare, also from the national politics, but that war and its effect made it necessary for them to make the difficult journey to differ with loved ones on the issues of war. This was an act of heroism and test of their consciences. Women who came from nations without war also had their share of the burden. Their journey was also a risk and a moral venture. They had to watch what they said, told their stories of pain and death of young men, young and old soldiers crying out for their mothers, nurses recounting soldiers, questions of soldiers asking them, can the women do something about the war? 100 years later, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the questions are the same. What are the women doing about the wars and horrific violence that the world is encountering? Can you do something about South Sudan? Can you do something about Sierra? Can you do something about the Democratic Republic of Congo? Can you do something about Syria, Yemen, Afghanistan, Iraq, Pakistan, and all of those places where conflict has torn the lives of women and turned it upside down? Can you do something? Can the women rise up and face the, challenge that the, the challenges of their government spending millions on wars while neglecting the basic needs of their citizens? Can the women do something? Can they just do something about the thousands of women and girls that are trafficked every year and sold into very powerful nations as sex slaves and prostitutes? Can you do something? 
Can the women do something about the rising waves of fundamentalism and extremism that targets primarily girls that are seeking education as a means of emancipation? Can you do something? Can the women from civilized nations like the U.S. do something about unarmed civilians that are gunned down like pigs in the streets by police officers? Can you do something? Can the women do something about the degradation of our environment? Can we all just do something about peace? Some would say the answer is yes, we can. Yes, we are. And yes, we will continue to do. But as we continue to say yes and yes and yes, yes, we can, yes, we will, yes, we are, there are challenges that we must be able to stand up to and face head on. We must refuse to allow ourselves to be burdened by the endless waves of negativity targeting our advocacy, gay rights, straight rights, Christian, Muslim, Tea Party, Democrats, Republicans, all of those things that tend to separate us as women. This is the time, this is the moment when we need to be together more than ever before. We must, as women globally distinguished ladies and gentlemen, refuse to give in to the tactics of fundamentalists who will go to every length to silence us. We must allow, refuse to allow social class and politics to divide the work that is before us. We must refuse to allow ourselves to continue to be bound by discriminatory laws and negative policies. We must break the shackles of negativity surrounding women's rights issues of FGM. Even if it is not in your space and sphere, it is up to you to stand up and say something. <laughs> Alita Jacobs, the convener of the conference 100 years ago, in her opening address reminded her sisters that, and I'll quote, although our efforts may not shorten the present wars, there is no doubt that this assembly will have a moral effect on the belligerent countries. She continued by adding, those of us who convene at this Congress have called it Peace Congress, but I have not called it a peace congress, but an international congress of women assembled to protest war and to suggest steps that may lead to warfare, to, to warfare becoming an impossibility. What is our charge today? Today, our charge is to keep the visions and dreams of our sisters who came a hundred years ago alive. We must keep the flames of peace activism alive. We must do everything in our will and power and insist that we will do whatever it takes, including scraping naked if it comes to that, <laughs> to make warfare an impossibility in the world that we live in. We must keep our advocacy stronger. We must do all that we can do to stand up to politicians. We must walk into spaces and demand that those structures that are supposed to bring our world back upright are dismantled, but particularly looking at the UN Security Council, five permanent members, does it make sense in this day and age? It's high time that we all begin to raise our voices and say those things that will make very powerful people uncomfortable. Because whether we like it or not, we are always not invited in those spaces. It's time for us to stand up, women. It's time for us to stand up, sisters. It's time for us to do some of the most unthinkable things. A hundred years ago, the, the journey to The Hague was not an easy journey. Some of us took airplanes. People came on ships. The women from the UK were denied, and because of the, 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 the threat of them coming to The Hague, ferry transportation was suspended. They had to go through a lot to get here. 
to set the pace for what we do in our lives today. In our case, can we just do something? The children of Iraq, Afghanistan, Nigeria, those 300 girls, the ones of Mexico and other places are asking us again, can the women just do something? Jean Adams, in her reflection on her time at The Hague said, and I quote, never have I been so thankful for any decisions. As I, at any decision, as I look at it now, the undertaking repaid all that it cost us a hundredfold. Can we look back at our lives and our times of activism and say we've been repaid because we did nothing but our absolute best? Whether you come from the U.S., whether you come from The Hague, whether you come from DR Congo, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, we may all have come in different ships, but we are all on the same boat now. We have the power to stop war and turn our upside-down world upright. Thank you.